time again. This is How to Pass in Clex plus Monday Motivation. Hi, everyone. My name is Regina Callion, and I am so happy to be here with you. We're going to be analyzing cues in nursing, and this is very important for you to be able to answer NCLEX questions now and for next generation NCLEX. Yeah, so we're going to get right into it. If you have not subscribed to this channel, go ahead and hit the subscribe button or like our Facebook page. We do this every Monday. If you're new here, this is where you need to be Monday at noon. All right. Here's our first question. Nurse Khan received a client that has a thrombolytic therapy following a myocardial infarction with streptokinase. Which of the following drugs should Nurse Khan have on hand if the client develops excessive bleeding or hemorrhage? Number one, heparin. Number two, vitamin K. Number three, amino caproic acid. Or four, protamine sulfate. I love this question. It is such a good one. I see a lot of twos and fours on the screen. Hmm. I see a lot of twos and fours on the screen. But which one will you choose? Are you prepared to have this? Are you prepared to have this question on your NCLEX exam? Are you prepared to have this question on your NCLEX exam? I want to know. All right. Okay. And as the answers are coming in, you may be shocked to know this. You may be shocked because I don't see anybody who have picked this answer. The correct answer, though, is actually amino caproic acid, guys. Tag the nursing student that you're studying with, because if you didn't pick the right answer, maybe your friend would not have picked the right answer either. That's just how it goes. Around here, sharing is caring. So we're tagging, we are tagging our favorite nurse, all right? Or our favorite nursing student. <laughs> okay, so a, a major complication of thrombolytic therapy. Remember, we're not talking about heparin. We're, we're, we're not talking about Coumadin, which you guys are used to seeing. We're talking about streptokinase. And so the antidote for that needs to be studied because this, this is a pretty common medication, everybody. We're not talking about a medication that you never see. It's pretty common. So um, this is an important point for you to know right now today okay and so the amino caproic acid is going to aid in the hemorrhaging or the bleeding that is taking place because it is going to um, inhibit the plasmogen which is going to inhibit the thrombolysis oh yes 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 this is a good question i'm moving on i'm moving on we're going to take it to pediatrics. And again, this is analyzing cues. Are you able to do this? Our scenario is this. An 18-month-old with Tetralogy of Fallot has a tet spell after having an invasive procedure. To improve the child's cardiac status, which of the following interventions should the nurse do initially? Is it number one, place the child in a knee chest position? Two, begin chest compressions. Three, administer oxygen. Four, position with head of the bed elevated. Oh, this is a great one. And honestly, for, um, for pediatrics and for um neonatology, right? Tetralogy of Fallot is going to be major. It is going to be a subject that you must absolutely take some time with and come to an understanding of it. So we have, are you going to place the child in a knee, knee chest position? Are you going to begin chest compressions? Okay. I love that. I love a good comment. I love a good comment. And that's a good one right there. Um, 
And then also administer oxygen and or and or position with the head of the bed elevated. And you must know this. OK, and I see a lot of people you guys are, you know, picking, picking definitely the right answer. So um, the correct answer is going to be number one, placing the child in a knee chest position. And so a text spell. Uh, OK, let me let me just go back to this. So in the virtual trainer, I go over uh, a whole page of notes about Tetralogy of Fallot. So if you're not familiar with Tetralogy of Fallot, get inside of your virtual trainer, check out that lecture. Tetralogy of Fallot is one of the most common or the most common congenital heart defects. Like hands down, a lot of babies can be born with it. And the term is Tetralogy of Fallot. However, you don't worry about the Fallot part, but for NCLEX, you have to understand the tetralogy. You have to understand the four abnormalities that are going to precipitate um, this condition that your baby is going to be presenting with. And we're talking about analyzing cues. So what are the major cues that you're going to see in a baby who has tetralogy of Fallot? Clinically, what are you going to see? What are you going to see? You can either give me the four findings or give me one of the what give me one of the abnormalities of the heart. Can you give me one of tetralogy of Fallot? Or you can tell me how this baby is going to present clinically. What are we going to see from this baby? I want to take some time here and just kind of focus in on the content because the content is where we really, really pass NCLEX. It's not about how many questions we do, it's the content. And so when we come to study. Be prepared to answer any kind of questions. Okay, so what do I see in the comments? Absolutely, we are going to see cyanosis. Now, why? Why do we have cyanosis? And don't just tell me that the baby is not getting enough oxygen because that's a very generic answer. When we're talking about Tetralogy of Fallot, when we're talking about Tetralogy of Fallot, I don't have my, my notes like I want to, right? Because I, I just been spending some time with this. Um, but what is causing the cyanosis? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I have some, um, and you're not allowed to say, you're not allowed to say low oxygenation because there's something else going on. We're talking about the heart. So if NCLEX asks you, what is going on to cause the cyanosis? You can't make it a respiratory issue. It's not a respiratory issue. There's something else going on. Mm. Mm. Okay, I'm looking at the cause. Pulmonary stenosis, definitely one cause. Overriding aorta. Oh, yeah. Okay, here it is. Everybody read this. You know, I'm loving the comments. Blue baby. Okay, there it is. OK, so the reason that the cyanosis is happening. Good job. That's a great comment. The reason that the cyanosis is happening. Um, I see. Do I see some more? Yeah, I love it. Yes, I love it. Love it. Love it. You guys have it. And, and sometimes there is a um, there is the opposite. There is a left to right shunt and there's a right to left shunt. So anyhow, what was I saying? Oh, so what's happening, what's causing the cyanosis is not just low oxygenation. It's not a respiratory issue. What's causing the cyanosis is that because there is that uh, ventricular septal defect, what's happening is unoxygenated blood is bypassing the lungs right? And going through the pulmonary circulation is bypassing all of that and it's getting sent out to the body. So the baby is receiving uh, the organs, right? All of the vessels are receiving unoxygenated blood because the heart is shunting in the wrong direction. So um, this, is a, this is a really big problem, a huge problem, because of course the baby is going to be presenting cyanotic. The baby is going to be presenting blue. And the thing about Tetralogy of Fallot, I want you to keep this in mind if you're not familiar with it, is if you have an issue where there is right to left shunting, right, in um, in touch all of your flow, um, there is an there is an issue that if the nurse says I'm going to put on oxygen on this baby, because most people would do that, right? You're going to put oxygen on a baby that's blue, but is that oxygen going to be effective? No, it's not. So. 
oxygenation um, on a patient with tetralogy of Fallot can yield no results. The baby can be totally unresponsive to supplemental oxygen. So hmm, what do we need to do for this baby? What is the remedy for tetralogy of Fallot? You need to know that. You absolutely need to know that. So um, the, the I'm looking at the comments. Yeah. So I'm looking at, yeah. So you have to do surgery on this infant. Now, sometimes a baby is not, uh, sometimes a baby is not prepared for surgery as a neonate. Like when you first are born, think about little babies. Are they ready to be put under anesthesia, have their chest cut open, their little tiny heart, you're trying to stitch and you're trying to fix it. Some uh, some babies are just not prepared for that. And doctors would not do that. Right. Um, so they will try to grow the baby so that the baby has a certain weight requirement and they can take anesthesia and all of these things. Um, so what you see is you can actually have toddlers running around with tetralogy of flow. Like they can literally have this, this massive, uh, heart defect, yet they're still growing. They're still functioning. And they learn to naturally compensate for this heart de deformation. So what they will do is during times of stress, whether they are eating, feeding, defecating, um, playing on the playground, you will see them begin to squat. And some, um, some babies and mothers and fathers don't even know that their baby may have this issue, but they notice that their babies are squatters. And babies just naturally learn to do this when they are tired because what does squatting do if if you have that if you have the, the knee to chest position during a tet spell and a tet spell is potential is it is a, a leaf it's potentially lethal to a child to a baby so during these spells um they stoop or they squat um they, they just will stop and it allows what it allows the heart to do less work and it's so it's so amazing because babies they don't know about tetralogy of flow, but they do know that if they squat, they feel better, right? So it, it does it it helps the blood to go to the vital organs. So you got to be able to you got to be able to explain this and expect this for your NCLEX exam. This is how content works. So anyhow, the the squatting position is going to be a, really essential for a baby, and it's something that we should do as an intervention for a child with tetralogy of Fallot that is in distress. What else? <laughs> Somebody said, you explained that better than I ever heard it before. Mm. Yeah, yeah, God is good, right? We can understand very complex things if we just take our time. So um, anyhow, we are talking about tetralogy of Fallot. It is a very, very present subject on your NCLEX exam. And you definitely need to know the four deformations. I don't know if we got them, uh, but we, we, you should know those, right? You should know the, the medications and the interventions associated with tetralogy of Fallot and that it can be treated it can be treated. But in the meantime, if a baby is not surgically prepared as a nurse, you're going to have to tell the, the parents, this child is going to have a, a difficult time getting big, right? Because what does feeding do to the heart? Feeding is a source of activity. So it's going to put more demands on the heart. These babies are not going to want to eat. OK, um, these babies may also have neurological issues. They may also have uh, problems with learning and development. Oh, my goodness, you guys. This is Monday Motivation right here across the nation. Shout out to Nurse Shelley. Passed NCLEX on her 17th try. I I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> God gets the glory for that. And you, because you didn't give up. I don't even, I can't even imagine 17. That might be one of our top numbers. How long did it take you? I mean, like how, how long did it take you to achieve your goal? And I guess at this point, it doesn't even matter because you got it. Now you got those letters behind your name. So congratulations. Thank you so much. Wow. I don't even know. I can't even go on. 17 times. 
17 times. Some of us are complaining because we have to take the NCLEX for a second time or a third time. We don't want to invest the money. Oh, forget it. I'm just going to be a nurse's aide or I'm going to go into business management or I'm going to do. No, you have a calling on your life to be a nurse. And if you settle, if you settle for anything less than being a nurse, shame on you right? Because you are missing out on an amazing opportunity to do a ministry. It's not about you. This ain't the motivation part. This is the question part. Why do you have to come on here, Nurse Shelly, and do this? All right. So any, anyways, let me say this. Oh, on the 17th of the month, was it on the 17th of the month or the 17th try? Glory. Did I read it wrong? Let me see. I'm trying to go back. Nurse Shelly, was it the 17th try or the 17th of the month? Somebody somebody fact check me because I was about to go into a whole praise. Either way, either way, I'm still proud of you. Okay. And anyways, I can still say this. It doesn't matter if it was the 17th of the month, the 17th of the year, and or the 17th, but we've had people that have taken it 20 times. We've had, had people that have taken it 17 times, 15 times. So don't act brand new. Like we don't have those type of testimonies around here because we, we really do. We really do. Okay. Let's get back into the content now. I love y'all. Y'all get me. Y'all get me going. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Question number three. The pregnant client is diagnosed with placenta previa. OK, when assessing the client, which signs and symptoms would the nurse expect to find? OK, here we go. Number one, a sharp stabbing pain Two, dark. OK, red vaginal bleeding. Three, painless bleeding or four, back pain. Yeah. Yeah. Come on in. Woo. All right. Here we go. Here we go. I like the I like what I'm seeing. Well, it's a mix between twos and threes. It's a mix between twos and threes right now. But there is only one right answer. This isn't a select all that apply. There is only one right answer. And that correct answer. And that correct answer is going to be number three. I, I, there's a lot of people that didn't get this one right, but you definitely have to, all right, you definitely are going to have to know placenta previa. And one of the main things about placenta previa is a uh, bright red vaginal bleeding that is painless. And usually without, um, usually, so usually the mother doesn't even realize it, right? Um, hmm. Sometimes it can happen before the event of more blood loss. So um, placenta previa is a, is a personal story for me because that's that's what I was. Um, my mom didn't even know it until like she was like nine months or whatever. And she said she went to go. I don't know why my mom did this. She went to go move the couch and she just started having this painless like bleeding and she got to the hospital and they're like, oh, yeah, placenta previa. And she was like, what is that? Am I going to like die? She didn't even know what it was. And so they told her and then, bam, emergency C-section. Here I come. In quick facts, though, you need to know the difference between placenta previa and abruptio placenta because they're kind of the same thing, right? In terms of a complication that happens, a complication that usually happens between the second and third trimester is when it's noted. So. Um, for example, if we're talking about abruptio placenta and placenta previa, we will say that abruptio placenta always has sudden painful bleeding, right? Sudden painful bleeding, whereas placenta previa, there's no pain. There's no pain. And usually, too, with placenta previa, the contractions are felt less because that placenta is before the baby. So the placenta is taking the brunt of the contractions, right? All right. Also, let's see. Um, for abruptio placenta, the danger of it, the dangers of abruptio placenta is decreased oxygenation um, to the fetus, premature birth, and also blood clots. Okay. 
Whereas for the mom, placenta previa, we're going to have the uh, maternal hemorrhage and premature labor. Yeah. So this is the book. This is the quick facts book. And um, you can get it at remarnurse.com. But this is the book that every nursing student should have. Period. 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 The thing about these two is that both of them actually, both of them actually, you may need to do a blood transfusion on your patient. So it's very important to know whether your patient is going to um, be able to receive that blood. All right. And remember with abruptio placenta, the reason why it's so painful is because you literally have the placenta detaching itself from the uterine wall. However, with placenta previa, you just have the placenta blocking the cervix and the baby comes out through the cervix. So if the placenta is blocking the cervix, then that means that there is no other way for the baby to come out besides a cesarean section. So if I asked you this question, what would you say? Which condition between abruptio placenta or placenta previa will have more bleeding. What do you guys say? Between abruptio placenta or placenta previa, which one is gonna have more bleeding? This is good stuff. This is content. Uh, every nurse needs quick facts. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, we're talking about <laughs> the best book. I love everything. I brought the Q bank. If I can extend that, those questions are good challenges. Absolutely. Yes, the question bank is also amazing. Do it after you have studied quick facts and VT, though, because those questions are um, challenging. Okay, so when it comes to bleeding, placenta previa actually has more bleeding. Yeah, placenta previa, I'm looking at the comments. Placenta previa has more bleeding. However, if I asked you, Mm, which condition will create a rigid board-like abdomen, that's going to be abruptio placenta. Okay. And if you have the five-star quick facts, you can read about it. I did a little chart on two, on page 51. All right. Moving on. We got to get into this content. Glory is almost one o'clock. Okay. Question number four. The nurse is caring for a client with a duodenal ulcer and is reporting pain. Which description of pain would be the most characteristic of a duodenal ulcer? Here we go. Number one, a gnawing, dull, aching, hunger-like pain in the epigastric area that is relieved by food intake. Two. Pain that increases after a meal. Mm -hmm. Three, sharp pain in the epigastric area that radiates to the right shoulder. Four, a sensation of painful pressure in the mid sternal area. Okay, we are talking about the duodenal ulcer, people. Hmm. What do you say? A lot of people are saying number one. A lot of people are saying number two. And just a little bit of people are thinking it's number three, the sharp pain in the epigastric area. I want you to be 100% for sure, for sure, that you know that number one is going to be more appropriate when we're talking about a duodenal ulcer. And again, um, you definitely need to know the difference between a duodenal ulcer and um, a peptic ulcer. Okay, a duodenal ulcer and a peptic ulcer. Make sure you know that, guys. And do I want to... I'm back in quick. Listen, for some of y'all who don't have this book, y'all going to mess around and make me read the whole entire thing to you. So 49 of Quick Facts for NCLEX. A gastric ulcer and a duodenal ulcer. You got to know the difference between the two, okay? Um, so when we're talking about where they are, if I say, where is a gastric ulcer at? What is the location of a gastric ulcer? What are you going to say? Okay, I'm going to read. I'm, I'm going to read it. I'm going to. I'm going to read it. So the gastric ulcer is going to be in the stomach, okay? And the duodenal ulcer is going to be in the duodenum. So. Another question from Quick Facts that you need to know is 
which mm, which one will have an increase in stomach acid production? Okay, which one is going to increase stomach acid production? Is it going to be the gastric ulcer or the duodenum or duodenal ulcer? Which one would you say where you're having more stomach acid? And it may not be what you think it is. Mm. The correct answer is the duodenal ulcer is going to increase more stomach acid. Yeah, some of you guys got that one right. Okay. When does the pain occur? This is also very significant. You, you, you want to know this, okay? So for the gastric ulcer, the pain occurs with meals or after eating. And that just makes sense. Okay, that just makes sense. A gastric ulcer is going to be painful. So you starve a gastric ulcer because you give your stomach, you give your stomach time to heal. Okay, yes, absolutely. You give your stomach time to heal. But with the duodenal ulcer, you're going to feel that when your stomach is empty and you're like hungry and it's just like, oh, I'm hungry, but there's pain. Like there shouldn't be pain. All right. So um, you'll go into it more when you read quick facts about the different type of medications, H2 blockers, proton pump inhibitors, antacids. What do you need to know to avoid these ulcers? So this is on page 49 of my quick facts book. Some of you guys may have a different version, but the five star right now is the most current. All right. And again, this is why every nursing student should have this book. It's very good for quick content. Question number five, we are staying alive. We are staying alive on question number five. A client is on respiratory isolation for tuberculosis. Which of the following would be an indicator for removal of isolation precautions? Number one, the absence of advantageous breath sounds. Two, Client has no infiltrates on a chest x-ray. Three, client has been on anti-tuberculin drug therapy with izonazid for one month's time. For one month's time. Okay. Four, two sputum cultures is negative for AFB following a course of isonazid and paraaminosilic acid. Woo, that's a, that's a mouthful for you. What would be the best indicator, okay, of taking a client at, off of isolation? It's gonna be the safest and best way. Okay. I am moving on here, and the correct answer is going to be number four. Excellent job. Yes, excellent job. So um, clients who have been on their anti-tuberculosin medication regimens for at least two to three weeks are going to be in a better position. And then also, if they have an, an absence of an AFB, at least two successive sputum cultures, no longer do they need to be, <laughs> somebody, I was driving, I was driving. Okay, it's okay, be careful. Be careful putting your answers in. Um, they no longer need to be on respiratory isolation, respiratory isolation for tuberculosis, all right? So make sure that you are understanding not only the disease process, but also not only the disease process, but also the parameters around it. So you can read more about um, the tuberculosis on page 61. Definitely with tuberculosis, you're going to see the classic signs of a productive cough, night sweats. Anytime you see night sweats, night sweats on the current NCLEX, low-grade fever, think that that patient might have a little tuberculosis. And maybe even if they've been out of the country too, just think about it because this is a this is a condition that is going to spread. It's going to spread pretty rapidly, especially if you're in the same living quarters. Like if somebody goes out of town, uh, out of out of the country, 
like China or Australia or something like that. And then they come back and they have a low grade fever. They have night sweats. They have a productive cough, right? Weight loss for your NCLEX, think tuberculosis. Remember, this is an airborne or respiratory isolation. So you definitely want to um, give the highest level of protection from yourself with a patient with tuberculosis. You got to know the um, TB antibiotics. Also, if a patient is taking TB antibiotics, it can cause a, a vitamin deficiency. And that deficiency is B6 deficiency. All right. So that's on page 61. Okay. It's on page 61. All right. Hey, speaking of quick facts, I am so, you know, I did a sale on the quick facts book, y'all. I did a sale on that book last week and I was so shocked because literally 1,000 quick facts sold that week. Like people were not playing. I thought everybody already had, <laughs> I thought everybody already had quick facts. Like why were we even doing a sale? And it blew me away how many people did not have the quick facts book so if you got your if you ordered your book it should be coming this week for sure we do have to send out a thousand of these books amazing 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 but the idea is that this is where you start your 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 prep okay this is where you start your um your journey to studying NCLEX I actually want you to get this book if you are in nursing school all right or you are preparing to go into the virtual trainer, you can go ahead and grab this book. Um, so this is a starting place. Now, I always say you want to match the quick facts with your virtual trainer workbook. You don't study, you know, you don't just, people ask me all the time, can I just pass with quick facts? You can get a lot of content for quick facts, but there is still this much more. And my VT book has been through it because I've been studying it. Um, the, this is also a huge part of my learning system. All right. Probably the biggest because this includes the lectures. So we have um, along with the quick facts, there is the virtual trainer workbook. And right now during Remar Nurse University, we are doing a sale on it. OK, we're doing a sale on the VT workbook. OK, and I want to tell you this. You have to you're going to have to follow the study calendar, all right? You're going to have to follow the study calendar, and that is going to be a six-week calendar. That's going to be a six-week calendar, and it's going to tell you what to do every single day, okay? Every single day. In addition to that, I want to give you a close-up on what you will be doing during that day. So... Three hours is my maximum. That's all I'm going to have you studying. That's all I'm going to have you studying. And you can see that it's going to be a mix. Let me show you the benefits of this. When you sit down, you will know exactly what to study. You're going to be studying from the quick facts and you're going to be studying from your VT workbook because the goal is that by the end of it, you're ready to test. You're ready to test. So once you get the calendar and once you get your quick facts book you are able to go directly into the virtual trainer where you where you will watch your video lectures okay so that's part of the training system when people ask me what is the vt that is the vt it's the common the combination of the two books and the online training system okay and I'm really, I'm really surprised at the amount of testimonials that we got. Even today, there were some people that got on and said, hey, Regina, I passed. I passed with the virtual trainer. And I didn't even get to shout you out. So let me know again so I can spotlight you. Because this is what Monday Motivation is all about. Doing what you need to do to be successful and get that nursing license. So our motivation today is prayer works. Prayer absolutely works, especially when you feel down, especially when you feel down. And notice this week or the past week, if you've had any, and if you had any instances where you felt down, um, and down could be a many different things. Maybe you felt stressed. Maybe you felt betrayed. Maybe you felt lonely. Yeah. Maybe you felt sad about something. Somebody disappointed you. Somebody disappointed you. 
And I like Kamisha's just keeping it real. She says, I literally just told my friends I'm ready, but feel so discouraged and I don't know where to start. All right. I'm glad you showed up today. I am glad you showed up today because this is a place where you can start. If you feel heartbroken or hurt, there, there are many reasons. I don't know. I don't know why you're not feeling normal, but if it's preventing you from moving on with your daily activities and your everyday work, and it's affecting your health, most importantly, I'm telling you, I think you should pray. I think you should pray. Why? Because that's the most powerful thing you can do for yourself or for somebody else. Um, you know, what does the Bible say in 1 Peter 5, 7? Cast all your worries on him because he cares for you. For you, it's really that simple. I like this saying, guys. It's another Bible verse you can write down. And you can say this to yourself in the morning. Like when you wake up, sometimes it's great to have just words of affirmation to yourself. I tell you guys all the time, and I love when you repeat it. What do we say around here? I can, I will, I must. Pass in clicks. You got to say it just like that. So you could also say this. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray for everything. Okay? Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray for everything. And this is Philippians 4, 6. This is Philippians 4, 6. Okay. When we work, we work. When we pray, God works. I like that. When we work, we work. When we pray, God works. Yes. How many people need to just screenshot that and make it your phone like screensaver? I'm going to do that right now. You do it too. Okay. I want to acknowledge this comment. That's true. When I felt the first time I found out my mom had cancer. Now that I'm trying to jump back into it, my dad is in hospice care. Yeah. So we need to pray for you, Nellie. We need to pray for you. Right now, let's pray for Nellie because this is a trying time for her. And I can't imagine. I can't imagine what it's like to um, have your loved ones in that situation while also feeling like you have a call to ministry. So right now, we're going to pray for Nellie. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord. We ask that you would just forgive us, Lord. Forgive us of our shortcomings. Forgive us of the times when we don't do what we should, Lord, but we are we are striving to, to please you. We just want to lift up our sister Nellie, Lord, right now as she is um she's in a time of um she's in a time of probably thoughtful uh reflection as she looks upon her father who is in hospice. Lord, I wanna thank you for the life and the time she's had with her father. I wanna thank you for even right now, the days and the moment that she spends with him. And I just ask Lord that you send peace into her situation. And that as, as we pray, she prays, Lord, and that, uh, that you hear us and you answer us very quickly. Lord, we thank you and we love you in Jesus name, amen. Nellie, thank you so much for coming to the session today. We are, encouraging ourselves through prayer. We are we are saying that when things can't be explained, we turn them over to you, God. And so um, that's what we do here, Remar. If it's your first time, this is what we do. Um, I also want to encourage you as part of Monday Motivation with a motivational testimony of a Remar nurse who passed in Clex and is so excited to tell you how he did it.
Oh, right. I love that testimony. He had all the books. He pulled out the books and used them. And as always, as always, the look on a person's face after they pass NCLEX and they fully embody that nurse, the ability to go into any job opportunity, into any position they want is priceless. It's beautiful. And I love it. Hey, I want you guys to get your license now and I want you to test now because did you know, did you know that NCLEX is changing? That's right. You got to be prepared for the changes or just take the exam now. Make it easy on yourself. Every Monday, I am going live for Remar Nurse University and we are actually... We are actually going over pharmacology. We're actually going over pharmacology. So this is going to be very important. This is going to be very important for you to attend this session, for you to attend this session. So check it out, remarnurse.com. Please, please, please download the workbook so that you can be ready, okay? And every Wednesday, I've committed myself to this. I've committed myself to this. Every Wednesday, we are going live for Remar uh, for Winning Wednesday. Okay, guys. So I definitely need to see you on Winning Wednesday as well. What you guys say you didn't hear? Okay, so you didn't hear. Let me try this again. I'm gonna play this testimonial again, and I want you to let me know if you can hear him. All right, let me try it because this is a really good one. I don't want you to miss it. No, there we go. You know what, guys? I don't know. I will figure it out. Sometimes tech is not always working, and that's all right. This is a live show, and we're real people. This is not like a movie theater or anything like that. So we will um, come back, and I will play the testimonial, I promise you, because there's nothing better than having real nursing students tell their story to you guys. So we'll get it back on. I know you can definitely see it on my YouTube channel. Right. You can definitely see on the YouTube channel that right now has 98,000 subscribers. <laughs> right. Yes, I know. That's exactly what it is. I I couldn't agree more. Like I couldn't agree more. You guys know whenever we do what we are called to do, then something else technical happens. And that's all right. We OK. We know how it rolls around here. Um, but I will just leave you guys with this um, Monday, Monday night, which is when tonight. It is tonight at 8 p.m. I will be going live and it's going to be a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful time. We're going to go over pharmacology and we're going to just dig more into the changes for NCLEX, the changes for NCLEX. Um, a lot of you want to know how to prepare for it now. So I'm giving you small insights, small insights. OK. All right, guys. So I will see you later. Um, you can, you will and you must. Pass in clicks, guys. See you later. Bye-bye.